Good evening. I see people still coming into our uh, Zoom room here and hopefully some folks also able to watch us on Facebook Live. So thank you everyone for giving a little bit of your evening to us tonight. Uh, it's part of the Preservation Resource Center of New Orleans ongoing dialogue series with contemporary architects and designers, building New Orleans then and now. This is part of a just a suite of educational programs that we run out of the Preservation Resource Center um, and really scaled up and brought online uh, back in 2020 and have uh, saw, saw fit to continue doing that now, um, both because uh, we can't uh, have a large gathering quite yet in our space here on Chapatula Street, but also because we get uh, viewers from all around the country we've found. And so welcome wherever you're coming from to, to spend a little time with us tonight learning and talking uh, first of all, I want to invite everyone who um, is not already a member of Preservation Resource Center to join as a member. PRCNO.org is our website, PRCNO.org, and there you can join and donate. And when you um, become a member, you receive our magazine, Preservation in Print. That's some excellent copies here since I'm in the office this evening, not at home. Uh, behind me, you see uh, timeline that was made for our 40th anniversary that shows some benchmarks in our organization's history. Um, for more than 40 years, more than 45 years now, we've been uh, not just advocating for the historic architecture and buildings of our city, but for the people who call it home and for its cultural identity. Um, you can also find on our website, prcno.org, some excellent gifts. Mother's Day's right around the corner. Wouldn't an autographed copy of Building on the Past Saving Historic New Orleans be a great gift for someone special in your life. Um, and last but not least, um, many of you will know because of the deluge of emails and online posts that you've already read, today is indeed Give NOLA Day. And we're this close to meeting our ambitious goal. I wanna thank the many people who did donate via givenola.org to Preserv Preservation Resource Center, to many of our allied nonprofits and organizations and partners in the community. You know, this is a community-wide day of giving here in New Orleans, and um, I would really ask if you haven't, go to givenola.org, maybe when this is over, or maybe on your phone uh, or your computer, depending on which one you're watching us on, um, and make a donation, even as small as $10 a person. Um, we really do uh, appreciate all of those donations and measure just as much the number of gifts as the total dollar amount at the end of the day. It all goes towards making us a stronger organization and making a more vibrant um, city for residents and visitors alike. So with that uh, housekeeping out of the way, um, I will let you know that the best way to ask your questions um, as, as you have them during the presentation is in the Q&A box. You can certainly use the chat function, but it can be hard for me to toggle between the two. So uh, if you stick with the Q&A, uh, we'll do our best to, to get through some of your questions at the end uh, after our presentation and, and some dialogue. And I will now introduce our special guest, Stephen Bingler, who is the founder and CEO of Concordia. Concordia is not just an architecture firm, they're also an urban planning firm. They have uh, really diverse staff, um, many of whom I've been able to work with over the years. Uh, that do historic restoration, historic preservation, new construction, and urban planning. Um, some of you might have encountered Stephen and his team uh, when they helped organize the Unified New Orleans Plan after Hurricane Katrina. Um, others of you might have read some of his work through his joint project with Martin Penderson, Common Edge, and um, I'm sure he'll tell us a little about that, but they have a very well-read uh, website that is, publishes articles routinely um, on the, the leading issues in urban planning, architecture, uh, and design. So um, Stephen studied architecture at University of Virginia and actually grew up near Charlottesville, um, but he, he left the mountains to our great benefit um, and came down here to the flatlands to build his firm and his career. And he's gonna to talk to us today about um, some of what makes our architecture unique and some of what makes our, our architectural heritage unique and where is that going? 
uh, where do we want it to go? Um, what are we doing with uh, the legacy that we, we have as New Orleanians in terms of our uh, beautiful built environment? So with that, Stephen, thank you so much for giving your time to, to be with us and all the thought and energy you've put into uh, your remarks tonight. And I really look forward to our, our dialogue about them. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I guess I should try to share my screen here. I think that's the next step, get the technology right. Can everybody see? Looks okay. good on my end. All right, well, I just want to thank you and, uh, and the PRC uh, as, a, as an organization for pulling this together. Um, I think it's always a delight for us to uh, have an opportunity to be collegial and be thinking about what we're doing and uh, really throw some things on the table that not, we all don't have to agree with. You know, we just, it's the most important thing is that, is that we're talking to each other and moving the needle a little further forward. Um, I want to compliment Alec Adamick for, I think, an excellent presentation that he made about H.H. H. Richardson, and in case anybody didn't get a chance to see it live and in person, I know you can find it on the PRC website, and I highly recommend that you go uh, and, and spend the time to listen to it. I thought it was very um, uh, instructive and, um, and relates in some ways to some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I guess maybe I'll, I'll just start uh, with um, this whole notion about uh, what is uh, uh, Creole romanticism. And um, I think I'm mainly gonna end with a discussion about what Creole romanticism is, but uh, Creole is of course uh, identified a lot with New Orleans and uh, anybody who thinks of Creole these days, they probably start thinking of New Orleans. So. Uh, I think some of this originated in my mind in a, in a discussion that we all had when PRC first invited, I think, five of us to sit down and talk about things. And, and I, I, I came to, th to think that, um, that we actually do have a voice uh, in New Orleans and, and we really do. There are things that happen in New Orleans that, that we all share. And so maybe it's an interesting thing for us to sort of uh, circle the wagons a little bit and figure out uh, what are those things that we share. And I, I'm going to postulate here today that one of those things that we share is a spirit of romanticism. Um, and uh, I've actually enjoyed this whole process of getting to know romanticism a little better. Um, and let me make sure this is working. Yeah. So before we talk about romanticism, um, we need to talk about classicism because uh, most people come to New Orleans and they think about classicism, um, and they and 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 classicism uh, is I guess the hallmark of classicism uh, is the fact that it's rational, it's logical, it's sequential, uh, it operates in some fairly simple geometries. It's kind of clean. Um, whether it is old world classicism um, that you see at the top, you even see Da Vinci's little uh, uh, modular guy, and at the bottom you see Corbu's modular guy. And uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that that these two forms, what we think of so different as being so different, are actually more alike than they are different. Um, they're like because they are rational and they're um, and they follow a kind of a rational uh, thought process. And uh, in, in, in New Orleans, um, we've been blessed to have a lot of old world classicism, uh, all the way back to you know, Benjamin Latrobe and Henry Howard and James Gallier, these people that we've heard so much about over the years, and we've always admired their buildings and, and the contributions that they made to New Orleans. And, and in some ways, I think we think that's what New Orleans is and that's what New Orleans architecture is. Um, and I think that to some degree that the, those, those, um, the spirit of that old world classicism lives today uh, in, the, in the work that I really admire of, of many architects and I'm only naming a few here. Um, I, I'm, I know how many I left out. So I just didn't have room for on one slide for everybody, so. I apologize to anybody who is um, left out, um, but not forgotten. But um, I've always admired uh, the work that um, 
Richard Koch and Sam Wilson uh, did over the years and Barry Fox and Frank Masson and uh, Danny Taylor and Robbie Cangelosi are kind of carrying that banner now. Uh, and and uh, I, I wanted to, to take a minute to honor uh, all of that beautiful, all those beautiful buildings and all of those beautiful ideas um, that are becoming manifest even still. Um, I also wanna, uh, I wanna honor the new world classicism uh, the new rational uh, thinking uh, that uh, I know some of us think about Buster Curtis and Al Ladner and uh, Wayne Troyer and Trey Trahan, Lee Ledbetter, uh, EDR. Uh, I, th I think the contributions that uh, these firms have made to architecture in New Orleans is, is uh, I mean, I mean we, we, now we, we can see our, our classicism, our, 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 our modernism you know, pretty much stands up against any modernist design in the country. And it's because of the, the hard work that uh, these architects and other architects have done. And here again, I, I wanna acknowledge that uh, this is only one slide. So if I put all of the beautiful uh, contemporary, contemporary uh, uh, buildings in here, uh, it, they would all look like little pixels, right? Uh, so, uh, I, I would like actually like to expand on on all of these slides at some point. Um, but here, what I'm here to talk about today is to is to kind of uh, add on to that conversation, the conversation about our classical heritage, uh, another conversation about our romantic heritage heritage. Um, and I won't go into a lot of detail about it. Um, it, it any of you who have studied romanticism uh, know that it goes back. Uh, it, it was kind of born at the end of the 18th century. And some of its strongest advocates um, uh, were, you know, people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote uh, a discourse on the origins of inequality. Uh, he also wrote a discourse on political economy. And he also wrote something called the social contract, which included in it something called the goodwill, the general will. In political theory, it's, it's a, it, it, what it means is that um, it aims for a common good and a common interest. And uh, Rousseau's ideas eventually got embedded in our, in our Declaration of Independence. It also got embedded in a lot of the, the um, movements that were happening around the French Revolution. Um, and the tenets of, of that period, differently than the rational, logical period of the enlightenment that preceded it. Um, and I think still is alive today in, in our uh, neoclassical architecture and our modern classical architecture are a different set of ideas and a different set of feelings. Um, some of those were very much human centered. Uh, they, they were really focused on the human being and they were even focused on what uh, we can what, what what we as a profession need to be doing for all of our fellow human beings. Um, the, certainly, the French Revolution uh, brought about uh, how do we uh, what is our relationship to the underserved population? Uh, it, and and it wasn't just architecture, but it was uh, uh, you know our, our, our humanity. I guess you you, you should say. So humanity was, our humanity was a really central focus of the romantic period, caused a lot of changes in our world. Um, and uh, another one of the really strong focuses of the romantic period was um, a, a true deep reverence for nature um, and really an awe of nature. And very opposite and different, I think, in, from the, some of the more rational and scientific approaches that we've taken to nature, but not only to nature, but the, the, the admiration that we all have for industrial uh, aesthetic and, and uh, sort of high-tech aesthetic. And, and so uh, I know I consider myself to be a naturalist, so I identify with these ideas quite a lot. Um, and uh, so nature, uh, this whole notion about nature is, was really, always really important to, to the architects and, and to the thinkers, the deep thinkers. You know, Wordsworth, as you can see here, Wordsworth says, 
come forth into the light of things, let nature be your teacher. And so I kind of want to put this on the table um, and, and I want us to go around and look at some of these slides on the, the, that, we, that are up here and, and see the different forms and how different these forms were uh, to the ones that preceded them. Um, and, and, and also that, um, you know, we, we have our, also our, our little uh, band of uh, romantic renegades in New Orleans who, who followed these, uh, I, these new emerging ideas that came out of the Beaux-Arts uh, in opposition to the uh, Age of the Enlightenment. Um, and James Ferret actually spent time at, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and he came home with a lot of those ideas. And uh, uh, it, it also uh, William Ferret uh, it did not go to the Beaux-Arts or at least it's not factually determined that he was there. Some people think he might have been there, but they know for sure James Ferret was there. And so, just look at this. Uh, look at these buildings. You know, they, they look at this castle that that is now the state, the state capitol building. Um, very different from the plantations. Very different from the uh, Greek revival um, uh, uh, architecture that we that we usually think of as New Orleans and in Louisiana. And and the, the, the building in the middle, um, uh, who knows where all those forms came from. They, they came from imagination and they came from a kind of transcendence. I think that, that those were other ideas. The, 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 what, you, what we see in these buildings is we see a lot of emotion. Uh, we see less rationality and we see a lot more emotion. Um, and it, it, was, it was considered in this period that the power, the power came from emotion and imagination uh, as opposed from logic and reason. And um, so, and that was all, as I mentioned, linked into this love of nature and, and admiration for the complex, the complexity of nature and the mystery of nature. Um, and, uh, and, and as, as Alec pointed out, um, in his presentation, you know, one of our great, um, uh, one of our, our, our great stewards of, of these ideas here um, was H.H. H. Richardson, and, and we see the Taylor Library on the lower right and his Trinity Church in, uh, in uh, Boston. But on the left, we also see James Gallier Jr. I mean, you know, you can imagine this is probably a father-son thing, you know, because James Gallier Jr. is going like, hey, dad, do the other stuff, right? Uh, I don't think I'm going to do that Greek revival stuff anymore. I think I'm going to go follow these other guys. So as we can see, the Luling plantation on the lower left, it doesn't look like most plantations that we're familiar with. Um, and also the Jockey Club uh, on the upper left. Um, it looks a lot more like the Luling plantation than it does um, uh, uh, some neoclassical buildings. So so these are the people that I admire. On your big that's my daughter calling. <laughs> um, the um, so these don't 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 look like what we normally think of as Louisiana architecture, uh, but they are very much Louisiana architecture. And I and I kind of want to uh, put a pin on the fact that they might be more Louisiana than we think, uh, because uh, the spirit of romanticism has generated uh, some of the the most powerful art forms that have ever come from our community. Um, the, those include jazz, you know, jazz is not, it's not strictly classical. Jazz is an amalgamation of things. Uh, it's a fusion of things. It's not a uh, lockstep uh, uh, logical sequential, right? It, 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 it has a lot of emotion. Uh, and, and the music moves with the emotion of the players. It's also an incredibly collaborative art form. So it has a lot of humanity in it. It's an, uh, jazz is not looking for the, for the star architect, the star architect or the star, the, what, do you, what would you call it? The star, star, star musician or however you want to see it. Um, notwithstanding that there have been jazz musicians that, uh, that have, uh, have come to stand for um, that that art form 
but it's more of a collaborative art form, I think, than most uh, musical art forms. And, and so I think we celebrate that. The same is true, I think, of our, um, of our uh, culinary um, tradition. And here, here again, I've only got these two guys up here, but uh, we all know that if, if we look at all of our jazz musicians that are in our community and all of our wonderful chefs that are in our community doing this beautiful fusion and amalgamation of things, um, that, that, wow, where would we be without that? So what I wanna do is to say, let's stop for a minute and, and let's think about this idea of romanticism and let's think about what it means because it is collaborative. It, it does represent, um, it's, it's not top down, right? It's more bottom up. It's more, let's throw a few more spices in and see, you know, uh, and see what happens, right? So uh, I was asked to make comments in this presentation, really, or, or, to, or to, to take a position, I guess, or, or I think more than anything else, it was a little bit of a realization on my part about well, how does all this impact uh, our work, right? Uh, why, am I, uh, why, why am I in the work that I've engaged in over all these years any different because I'm in New Orleans as opposed to if I'd been in Virginia? And I, oh my goodness, <laughs> Don't get me started because, um, you know, if I was in Virginia, I think it's probably one of the reasons I left Virginia is because Virginia is a lot more logical, sequential and rational and New Orleans is a lot more fun and interesting and, and emotional. And so here I am. So I, I really kind of wanted to, to throw on the table some ideas that, that where I believe, what I believe is that, um, that we do have a contemporary expression in New Orleans in architecture and, um, and it's not just uh, the work that we've done, but I'm gonna I'm gonna run through some slides of some of the work that we've done, and I also want to uh, call out um, uh, our, our colleagues at Wagner and Ball because I think that they have done a lot of work that that relates to these ideas, um, and I also want to call out uh, uh, Jonathan Tate um, that, and I kind of want to use these as examples, use our our three firms' work as examples of how um, I think romanticism is alive and well uh, in New Orleans architecture. And that um, I also wanna add that I'm sure there's a lot more romanticism that I, that, that, and a lot more are people whose works need to be included. Uh, but I'm gonna start in 1982 uh, with a project that I took on uh, when I was still at Perez Associates, it was the Intercontinental Hotel. Uh, 400 room hotel right next to the Pan American building down uh, Pan American Life Insurance uh, building down on uh, Porger Street and St. Charles Avenue. And at the end of that project, I, I, I got this idea that I would like to do a courtyard and I would like to do a New Orleans courtyard and that I would like for it to be, to have this mix, right? And that it would be a mix up, almost like a jazz band, right? So let's say, see how many in instruments we can, or how many different uh, yeah, instruments we can uh, include in the composition here. So I invited Lynn Emery, um, uh, and, and you know that was back in the day when you know not many people knew who Lynn Emery was, and uh, and Patricia Whitty Johnson, um, and 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 as two visual artists that that came to the table. And then I won't go into all the details, but I also had invited a, an, a physicist from Tulane University and a mathematician, um, algebraic topologist specifically, um, and a guy named James Drew, who was a new music composer at the time. And I, I said, let's come together and let's design a courtyard, a New Orleans courtyard. And I won't go into all the details, but I will tell you that in this courtyard, there are trees. Uh, you can see Lynn Emery's trees on the upper right. Um, there's music. You can see on the lower right musical instruments that Lynn designed along with James and the physicist uh, because we didn't know how to make those pipes make music until we got the physicist involved in helping us. Um, we also have a piece of anamorph, what's called the, the, actually it was the mathematician who came up with the idea of this anamorphic projection. So it's a, a stainless steel cylinder. When you look in the cylinder, things uh, look real. And when you look at them in two dimensions, they look distorted. So it's a little bit of a reversal there. I won't go into all the details, but, but this was one of the most exciting projects I've ever worked on. 
uh, there was so much energy and so much creativity I can't begin to, 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 uh, to, to say. And I'll just, uh, as an example of that, the musical instruments that were created by Lynn Emery and um, the physicist and, uh, and the composer were actually used uh, to conduct a piece of new music that James Drew composed, performed uh, at the Orpheum Theater by the, uh, by the New Orleans Symphony. So you, wow. you might be able to imagine how much fun that was. So if that was so much fun, then we decided that uh, why, would, why would we want to stop having so much fun? So we, we decided to do a similar thing at the Contemporary Art Center, where we invited a number of visual artists to, to basically commune with us and to make architect architectonic scale sculpture. Uh, and the front desk was a glass sculpture by Jean Koss and, and the, uh, the sculpture that, that was over the uh, circular ramp or the over shaped ramp uh, was a piece by Martin Payton, largest piece Martin ever did. Uh, of course, he's still around, so maybe he'll do a bigger one. At any rate, um, there, the spirit of the Contemporary Art Center uh, project was that collaboration and, and um, and we've been doing it again recently over at the Ashe Cultural Arts Center, working with Luther Gray, who is master drummer in the city and leads the drumming at Congo Square uh, every Sunday, if anybody's interested. Um, and so Luther taught me about the uh, bambula rhythm. And so we took that bambula rhythm and we turned it into a bambula wall that's about 100 feet long. And, um, and so then the, that becomes the bambula structure. Uh, the rhythm actually is, is, you can actually look at it and see it. You can see it undulating. And, and, um, and then we went beyond that and we are, this is a work in progress and I see uh, Randy Fertel is on the call. So I wanna, I wanna give a shout out to Randy for helping to provide some of the financial support for this next phase of this project. Uh, where we're gonna uh, imbue this, this uh, bambula wall with artworks uh, by Ron Bichet and Io Scott and some other folks. And we already have a piece of music that was created by Jason Marcellus uh, that is going to be the sort of the background. Uh, if you look at the image on the, on the middle on the top, uh, you'll see the musical, the actual musical score. And it would be way corny for us to just put musical notes on this bamboo wall. So nobody wanted to do that. But uh, what's gonna happen is these artists are gonna create works of art, uh, pieces of art um, that will be attached to the wall in various places. And we don't know what yet because you know, we're still in the process of figuring it out. So I, mean, I, I wanted to so, so to say, th this is what I mean by, this is an emotional thing. You know, this, this is, um, it is a collaborative thing. It's a democratic thing, right? Uh, and and to, in that sense, I think it's a, a lot more aligned with the, the spirit of romanticism than the spirit of classicism. Um, these are three housing uh, houses that we've done. Uh, the one on the left is my personal house, um, Neon Place, um, and in it, it 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 does it has a lot of, of idiosyncrasies, um, but it also has some rationale in that all the rooms in the house are are conformed to musical proportions. Um, and also the center uh, organizing feature of the house is something called a vesicle Pisces. So it has some sacred geometry. It's not just linear geometry or sequential geometry. It's geometry that goes more into golden ratios and, um, and that, that sort of a transcendental side of geometry as opposed to the linear sequential side of geometry. Um, uh, in the middle is the house that we designed for the Make It Right project. And, and the geometry there was actually a simple rectangle that we sliced an angle through. And, uh, and then we let that angle just do, it, do its thing. Um, I will point out that, the, that this, both of these projects, and the, the, my, my home and also this project and the, and the next project on the right, which is our, a new business that we started called Shibusa Systems. Uh, to manufacture, literally manufacture affordable housing. So this is the first mock-up of a Shibusa home that's actually on a fairly strict grid. So there's three different geometric ideas going on here. We're not locked into any one geometry. Uh, we we kind of like having a little bit of everything and uh, to play with. 
But we also, I also want to point out that every one of these buildings is, is very tightly connected to nature. Uh, cross ventilation is really important. Uh, the, the, they're, they're solar powered. Um, they all, they're, my own home has five geothermal wells uh, to, to drive the, the heating cooling system. Um, it's one of the first LEED certified residences in the country. And, um, and so uh, I really take great uh, pride in, in connecting uh, to, to nature. And even the fact that all three of these buildings have sloped roofs, there's a reason for that, because I have a tremendous respect for gravity. <laughs> um, and gravity is uh, a really important lesson um, that nature has to teach us. And I realize that some architects love to defy gravity. And I, and I fully support uh, anybody who decides that's what they want to do, because I mean, heaven knows there's lots of different ways to do it. We can engineer almost anything. But I, on the other hand, am, am my, a lot more interested in just uh, accepting gravity and maybe working with nature instead of against nature. Um, I'm, not, I'm not condemning anybody who decides to defy nature. Uh, my experience is that, you know, what do they say, you know, you, you don't, you know, don't go against Mother Nature because she'll come back at you. And so I think that, that to some degree, um, I mean, that's happening. So this is a pavilion that we designed uh, for Ursuline Academy that also includes, includes some, some sort of geometric studies that are, are, are actually more closely tie, tied to the natural world. Uh, this Vesca Pisces it shows up pretty prominently. But it also shows up in Gothic architecture, and so the windows that you see on the left slide, all the way back in the in the, uh, the, the 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 building in the back, on the brick building in the back, those Gothic shaped windows are are replicated. The geometry is replicated almost precisely in these stainless steel lines um, of these canopies uh, in this pavilion. Uh, but they're there not uh, because they're holding up an arch, because that. We don't need them for that anymore. They're there because they represent some deep ideas about geometry and uh, intersection of circles. Uh, when circles overlap in certain ways, they produce these shapes and, and these shapes are, are deeply connected to nature. Uh, and uh, through, uh, some of us think of Fibonacci numbers, some of us think of golden rectangles and things like that, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Of, of these deep connections that have go all the way back to indigenous cultures. Um, another thing I mentioned was um, about the romantic period was this notion of, of connection to humanity uh, and engagement of humanity. So um, uh, certainly in, in our work, we've actually developed a, something called the round table where we've been doing a lot of engagement work for so long that now we're starting to flip it around and turn it back around and bring people in and. And, and share some of the knowledge that we've gained um, through that process, some of it hard earned. Um, this is a meeting that took place in uh, right after Hurricane Katrina in the center here at the convention center. And there were four broadcast television screens. So easy for us to do Zooms now. Um, yeah. But back in those days, we had to do it through broadcast television. Uh, and one, each one of those screens was connected to three or 400 people uh, in, in a room, in each rooms, in one in Dallas, one in Houston, one in Atlanta, and one in Baton Rouge. So it was the first time any of the 1,500 people in this room had even seen some of their relatives after the storm. Interesting that now COVID um, uh, puts us back in some of those, into the, some of those same conditions. So I also want to really call, call out um, uh, a really a tribute to uh, Wagner and Ball because at the same time, and we all worked together on the unified plan, um, they were also working on the Dutch dialogues and go out, going out to Netherlands and you know, getting all this information about you know, water and how to design with water. And then they came back and they, and, and they worked really hard to make sure that those ideas were actually in, included in the policy of the city going forward. Um, and, and today, I, I, I honestly say that, that we can credit David Wagner possibly with saving New Orleans um, going forward because all of the, we all know that now 
you know, painfully we have to, you know, we have to take the first inch and a half of water and do something with it uh, besides dump it into the drainage system. Um, and, and, and that wouldn't have happened without David's work. And, um, and, and, and so I, I, I really think that this, this, uh, this kind of um, um, reaching out for, to humanity and, and trying to deal with some of these wicked uh, problems in our, in our time uh, is something that Wagner Wall is taken on with, with great um, force. I also admire their architecture uh, because I think it's not, you know, it's, it, it does have some softness to it. It's not trying to um, you know, overpower uh, uh, humanity. It's, I, f I feel like it has a lot of humanity in it. So I just included that in here just for conversation. Somebody can uh, disagree, that's good, you know. Uh, 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 and I think Jonathan Tate is a, another uh, architect I, whose work I really admire in the city. Um, partially because I think Jonathan decided to work within a vocabulary that's more familiar as opposed to one that's more unfamiliar, right? And so uh, I'm not making a value judgment about what each architect decides to do, but uh, I will say from my own personal uh, taste, I think this is a, a, more, a more romantic approach. It's a more, I feel a, that it has a human touch. Um, and that it wants to blend in more than stand out. Um, it's, it's, it's um, anyway, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I do want to end with this. Um, I, I've always been intrigued by, the, by how we got to where we are. And, and one, one of the documents that, that I love to read and go back and read again is, is the Bauhaus Manifesto. And and for any of you who haven't done it in a while, I really encourage you to do it because Walter Gropius had it right uh, when he said, let us strive, let us conceive and create a new building of the future that will unite every discipline, architecture, sculpture, painting, and which will one day rise heavenly, heavenwards from the million hands of craftsmen as a clear symbol of a new belief to come. And I think he really nailed it. <laughs> I don't know exactly where we see that today that much in our architecture as a whole. Um, I, th I think that, that we have now starchitects. Um, we don't have uh, as much architects and artists working collaboratively together, uh, painters and sculptors and craftspeople. Um, and at least that's my view of it. And, and, and so I think that um, I kind of want to end by saying maybe sometimes the best way to go forward is to go back. And, and I think that, that I personally would advocate, uh, you know, going back to these principles of collaboration, of, of uh, principles of uh, amalgamation, you know, the ones that, that I talked about earlier with jazz and about uh, our culinary tradition. And, and my what if is what if New Orleans uh, contribution on the architecture side uh, can, can mimic a lot of those same principles um, where, where it's all for, it's, 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 it, we're all in it together. And I, I know that I learned this from my friends at the Ashe Cultural Arts Center. There's actually a West African term for it. It's called Ubuntu. And Ubuntu literally means I am because we are. Um, and to, in that spirit, I wanna thank, um, my friend Ann Masson, who, who helped me figure this out, um, I threw it on the table and, and, and then and she said, no, that's not right. <laughs> and I threw, I threw some of these ideas out there and she said, well, you kind of got some of it, but you know, and she has been very, very helpful. And she's one of the most generous and, and uh, um, uh, preservation uh, uh, architects, I would say that I know. I also want to thank Dr. Leonard Duell. He, he passed away recently. He, he was a mentor of mine. He was a medical doctor and an urban planner. And he taught me the connection between uh, cities and bodies. And uh, he, he developed a program, a, a worldwide program called Healthy Cities um, and, and where we can, we can see our transportation systems inside of our bodies and we can see our transportations inside of our cities. Uh, through all of our tributaries and veins and arteries and things. 
and, and our organs in our cities and, and all of that together. And then lastly, I really want to reach out to Fritz Alcapra, who I um, have had a longstanding relationship with. Um, and I really encourage anyone who might be interested in the complex adaptive systems of the natural world to, to, to take his course uh, or read his books. Um, he, he is a genius, um, uh, really a genius and a contributor in this whole field of complex adaptive systems. And I feel like if, if, if anything, uh, as we look, as we face uh, now uh, climate crises, we face uh, race and equity crises, uh, we, we face crises almost at every turn, we have pandemic crises. Um, I, I do believe that the way out is a complex adaptive process. It's not going to be rational probably. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I feel strongly about and have learned so much from this little exploration that you just heard, um, um, that I've really learned a lot and reinforced a lot of thinking that I've been doing about um, why I think that, that this messy place uh, of, of romanticism has a lot to teach us. And so uh, I, I also, last but not least, uh, shout out to my writing buddy, uh, Martin Peterson, and uh, encourage you to tap in if you're interested into commonedge.org. We started this way back uh, five or six years ago, and uh, Martin is an amazing editor, uh, formerly uh, for 15 years, the executive editor of Metropolis Magazine. And Martin is, um, we, we, we've now published over 400 essays on the various topics that, that I just talked about. Uh, and, and, and so I if you're interested, I would encourage you not only to read uh, some of these articles, but also if, if, you, if you have it in you to write an article. Uh, Martin is a very gifted editor. You don't have to be an expert writer. If you have an idea, he will help you get it out. So um, cool. uh, with that, uh, last, 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 my last, last uh, compliment is I really want to give a shout out to all my colleagues at Concordia. Um, you know, we've, we, we've been around for 37 years now and, um, and some of us are still in the same place and some of us have gone on to work in other places and, you know, people like Wayne Troyer and, and, uh, and other people in the community um, have passed through Concordia and, and, and uh, honor, uh, uh, honor uh, deeply all of the work that has been done and all the work that is being done now by the brilliant colleagues of mine who um, have taken this on. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Stephen. That's um, a very rich presentation. So I uh, held my tongue rather than uh, interjected a couple of points, but uh, I think that gives us a lot, uh, a lot to discuss and dialogue on now. Um, I, I can also endorse uh, the Common Edge uh, newsletter, the, the email wrap that y'all do with, uh, you know, this week's stories. That's a great way to uh, get, uh, follow along and stay informed with the, the writing work and the research work that y'all are documenting with that project. Um, I think the, just we've got to start somewhere. So start at the beginning. I think um, you showed several of those Greek revival buildings, including you know some here, and that's very much you know part of our landscape in New Orleans, but also it's part of the architectural landscape across the American South. You know the archetypal plantation home and many city halls and county courthouses um, are in that Greek revival style, and um, in a way, then the romantic counterpoints you showed to that, um, some of them are, are revivalist or, you know, were part of national styles to an extent, but it's, it's part of what sets New Orleans aside, I think, the romantic element from the rest of the South. We're indisputably a Southern city. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for uh, the surrounding industries that grew up sugarcane and cotton that needed a port. Um, but we also have a sense that New Orleans is very different from the rest of the South, that there's something unique about this place. And some of it might be in that romantic spirit. And then that, you know, 
hunger for Creole forms, whatever that takes. The other thing that I think uh, stood out to me um, was the, the idea of New Orleans almost being uh, an imagined place, that it, it took a great deal of imagination and it's still taking a great deal of imagination and creativity for a city to survive in this kind of particularly precarious part of the world. You know, the uh, logical place to perhaps uh, build the original capital might have been in Mobile or in Baton Rouge and the logical place um, it, by a lot of standards today might not be here at the edge of the continent where we're battered by storms and our land is sinking um, but there's something about that romanticism that keeps people coming as tourists and uh, like you and I to make careers here and live here and there's something um, about the edge of the continent nature of this city that does take a lot of imagination. Well, somebody said that uh, New Orleans is the northernmost island in the Caribbean. So, um, you know, we certainly got the blend um, and we got good geography and a lot of creativity just bubbling over, I think. Yeah, I wonder to what extent, I mean, it clearly seems to be uh, true in your experience that um, the creative disciplines thrive off of one another. Um, in, in your examples of here in that courtyard, for instance, you know, having people who are creative thinkers or the Ashe example, but not in the architecture space in, in these allied fields, does that spur you on, you find? Yeah, I, I, actually, I'm I'm looking at the at some of the comments, and I, I think one of them relates to that. Somebody's asking about, um, you know, or is is the PRC going to be involved in some of this federal money that's coming down, and and uh, that could stimulate uh, a lot of the kinds of things that that um, a, a, a kind of a romantic. Uh, I mean, I think about, for example, you know, the the. Um, the, the WPA, uh, I think, was a, a good example that that artists really uh, took a major role in the whole WPA movement. And look at City Park and, and uh, Ricky right. Alvarez and uh, and other people who, uh, I mean, that, that was a, an amazing moment. Uh, I'm not saying that's the only moment, but also right around that same time, with that same within that same sort of between. Uh, uh, between uh, 19, maybe, I guess the end of the last pandemic and, and beginning of World War II, uh, there was also the, the sort of the streamline movement that, that, that included Art Deco, right? And, and I think that a lot of artists and, art and architects work really closely together in that movement as well. I think about Rockefeller Center, uh, you know, where it's just, it, it's hard to separate the building from the, from the art. Right. Uh, right. The, the art and the building were, were kind of infused in the same way that uh, classical buildings were, you know, the column capital is, is, is not necessarily architecture, it's more sculpture. So I, I do think that, that we should all get on board with trying to figure out how the culture bearers of our community can, can take a, the best advantage of, of the, this opportunity that's coming up with um, I mean, we have our 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 one percent for art on some projects that include, I think, most often a mural or 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 freestanding piece of artwork in a space. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it could be interesting if we, if we as architects open up our design lab uh, a little more, so mm -hmm. that we can see what more about what happens when art art artists and architects actually co-design. Uh, a, a building together, and also what happens when architects and the community co-design 
a building together. Uh, it's one thing to have community engagement. And I think it's another thing that we are aspiring to at Concordia, which is to say, let's, let's, let's don't just, um, you know, let's, let's just don't design the building with the community. Let's co-design, or at least let's don't design the building for the community's needs. Let's co-design the building with the community. I'm not saying we meet all of those uh, goals. Uh, I mean, we have a long way to go, but I think that is one of our aspirations. Also, uh, there was a question here about um, given the longing to include craftsmen, does Richardson offer a way forward? Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I think uh, th that Richardson and the like, um, that is w what they did. They, they um, and green and green, right? I mean, green and green was not just the names of the two guys who, who did those buildings, but the, the green was embedded into that work and the people who were carving uh, uh, those beautiful components um, had as much to do with the end result as the architects who, who decided where those components would be placed in the building. Mm -hmm. So also Randy Fertel asked, uh, what should we read about Capra? I highly recommend his book, um, the, the, his late, latest book, it's called um, The System's View of Life. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a compendium of all of his work. I mean, it's, it's, his, it's his life's work in one book. It's a, it's, it's a deep read though, I gotta tell you. It's not, it's not light reading, but, but it's extremely wonderful and informative. Um, that sounds great. And so some, uh, somebody named Lauren Sini uh, made that same observation in the chat about um, uh, the WPA uh, and how do we think the pandemic will affect the future of design? I, I will tell you, I think the pandemic and, and Hurricane Katrina and climate change and, you know, all, and, and, and you know, uh, identity politics and all of these things are coming to a head. Um, and I, th I personally think that they will drive the future of design. Um, I don't think we will have quite as much leeway as we have in the past to be, to, to have our individual mark. I think that there's gonna be a collective, um, uh, uh, whether we like it or not, <laughs> um, climate change is real and climate change is extremely scary. And I, I, I'm afraid, um, I, I like to say I know too much about climate change. And, um, and that's why I can say it's scary. It's, it's potentially tragic and catastrophic. Yeah, I think in my mind, that's a little part of the answer to the other question from an anonymous viewer about uh, PRC's role in kind of advocating around federal infrastructure investments. I mean, obviously, we want to see those investments made in a way that um, doesn't do unnecessary harm to historic resources, you know, not, not more running highways through communities, which is mistakes we've made in the past, but also see um, the type of investments that <laughs> help keep New Orleans on the map uh, in 50 and 100 and 150 years. I mean, that, and both the, the clean energy side and uh, decarbonization side and on the resilience adaptation, coastal restoration side, you know, it's gonna take both and to protect this place that we love and you know, we exist to help be stewards of. So I think that's a, a piece of the answer um, to the question about federal infrastructure. And if we can do it in a way that creates jobs for craftsmen and, and people who are making our buildings more energy efficient, for example, so much the better. Couldn't agree more. So Stephen, you um, showed those great sculptures from Lynn Emery. I had the privilege of meeting her son recently. You know, she's passed away um, and he's now looking for a preservation buyer for her former studio um, in an old theater. Um, actually not that far from your house probably. So if anybody's on the line and you wanna restore a very cool theater, um, look me up on the PRC website and I'll connect you. 
but yeah, they're very, very much looking for a community minded preservation buyer for a really unique space. Um, great. But yeah, her, her work was, was, and is amazing. It's great. Yeah. Um, and I think we have a lot of very talented artists in our community and, and, um, and I, I, I think that, um, we would all do well to encourage uh, them to follow some of Lynn's um, uh, beautiful. She was very uh, gifted, but but she was also very community minded, and um, and she always loved working in collaboration. Um, she was she had a wonderful spirit of give and take, um, and she was just a very generous person, and uh, I really cherished the time I spent working with her. I also want to just um, uh, throw out there that if if anybody has ideas about any of these things that um, that I'm throwing out there, uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, uh, stuck on anything necessarily. I'm actually uh, exploring, always exploring um, positive, negative. Um, I'm, uh, I would love to hear, uh, you know, you're welcome to send me an email, sbingler at concordia.com. Um, part of the reason my phone rang is because I never turn it off. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I encourage the dialogue. Well, I appreciate that. I really appreciate your dialoguing with us. And I think um, that's a great opportunity for me to plug the, to plug the, uh, final installment in this series, New Orleans Then and Now, which will be a roundtable discussion with the participating uh, architects and designers and um, and some others. So we are very much uh, in interested in having uh, some more special guests be a part of that roundtable, which will be May 25th as the culminating piece of this series. And um, the next installment in this series will be on Thursday with John Campo, who's gonna talk about um, the proficiency his firm has developed around using historic tax credits, specifically in the hospitality space, uh, what he's learned from working in lots of different old buildings and also now in, in mid-century, uh, 20th century buildings that um, have reached that age of eligibility for historic tax credits and, and uh, pushed him and his firm into to new territory and new ways of approaching their work. But um, one of the, the things that I'm, he may talk about, Stephen, is his experience on the Jack's Brewery project with you. Yes. So I wonder if, uh, looking back, you, you also feel that that was a sort of seminal moment, a seminal sort of gang of designers and what you learned from working on that project. Yeah, it was one of those all in things. I mean, it, we had two, we had 24 months uh, and two, because that was when the World's Fair was gonna open and, and uh, we, we never imagined that the World's Fair would wait for us. Um, so we had 24 months to, to, to design that building and, um, and build that building and, and renovate that building. And about halfway through, uh, the interior of that building was completely gutted. And the only thing left were the freestanding masonry walls, four stories tall, all braced up with steel uh, 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 beams. And uh, it was scary uh, at, at times, but maybe one of the most important things about that project was, and, and maybe it, in some ways it, 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 got, it got me to thinking a lot more about the community and, and engagement of the community, is that we couldn't have done it without the engagement of the community. Um, the, the, there, there were lots of meetings uh, that, that took place. Uh, there were lots of, as you can imagine, there were lots of opinions uh, there were actually contradictory preservationist opinions. Uh, we actually had the View Cray Commission that, that demanded that the building be, the, all the details in the building would be exactly as if Dietrich Einsiedel had done them in 1893. And then we had the National Park Service. It was actually one of the first National Park Service historic tax credit buildings in the country. And, um, and so the National Park Service said, no, thank you. That's not the way we think. We think that that someday our archaeologists are going to climb all over this building, and we don't know, you know, what this Concordia uh, group did. Uh, we don't want to have to, you know, dig around and figure out what Concordia did versus what Dietrich Einsiedel did. We want that distinction to be fairly clear. 
So here we are trying to, you know, be preservationists, and we find out that we have the preservationists are against the are against the preservationists. And so that, that's actually how we came up with the design is we said to the National Park Service, well, you know, the riverfront at that time was just a bunch of warehouses and, and there was no park, there was no aquarium, there was none of that. And, um, and the only place that anybody in the city could touch the river was at the moonwalk. And um, so we said, well, you know, the, the, the riverside is the future and, and the land side that faces the French Quarter is the past. So how about if we just sort of interpret the details on the land side to match more closely to the details of the, um, of the city of the French Quarter. And then how about if we just do this big glass box uh, on, the, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the river side for the, basically for the National Park Service's benefit mm -hmm. uh, to say that, you know, that's, that's the part that Concordia is gonna lay claim to at some point in the future, you know, if you're interested, you know, you, you, you won't be able to mistake it for, um, for those turrets uh, on, on the land side. So actually it was a, it was a mediation uh, that took place, uh, not only with those two historic agencies, but also with divergent uh, positions of, from the preservation community. And, um, and it, was a, it, it turned out to be you know, a, a labor of love and it was a delightful experience. In hindsight, you know, it was for the for the, you'll you'll hear from John Campo that for 24 months we didn't sleep, you know we, we were working out of my house in the French Quarter on St. Peter Street, and uh, and you know I, I got up every morning to you know six or eight architects in my house, and uh, and we worked until midnight and and uh, somehow we got it done. So I'm delighted. I'll be be interested to hear John's recollections about that. Those are great stories. Um, yeah, that, it, it, that also um, makes me think of uh, one other aspect of um, your discussion around collaboration is that when you, when you collaborate or when you attempt to co-design with a community, you know, you, you open up the possibility for conflict and, you know, is the sort of conventional model of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the great you know, trained designer, and you're, you're going to appreciate it when I get done, trust me, you know, is that in some ways a, a cop out because the conflict can be the hardest part of doing something that's collaborative. I do think we have to embrace the, that complexity. And I think that whether that complexity comes in, in the work that we do with nature or whether it comes in the work that we do with each other, um, it's not going to be easy. Yeah, but it gets easier every time you do it. I will say that. We, 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 uh, we, we, I, we have an expression in our office that we have scars all over us, but we try not to get a scar in the same place twice. <laughs> sort of a, a learn by doing. Um, right. Yeah, and also sort of like building those muscles of uh, handling conflict when it arises and, and working in a team setting. Yeah, conflict is a natural part of life. So might as well get used to it. All right, Stephen. Well, I think we're coming to just over an hour. So I want to be respectful of your time and, and everyone else's and, and just thank you once again for your thoughtfulness um, that you put into this presentation, the thoughtfulness of your approach and your willingness to engage on these ideas. I'm looking forward to, to more lively conversation at the round table. Um, and wanna um, add one more person to thank that I failed to thank earlier, which is Laurel Fay, who is a Tulane master's student, interned with us over the spring semester and helped pull together a lot of this series. So Laurel, if you're watching, thank you so much for the legwork that you did in uh, making this happen. It wouldn't have happened without your help. Uh, and I also wanna thank everybody who's donated to Preservation Resource Center through GiveNOLA today. Um, I am privileged to get to report that we hit our goal of raising $30,000 and we can uh, now surpass it with your gift if you didn't get a chance to donate. Um, but thank you so much to the people who have supported us in the community and know that, that those gifts go back into the community through our Revival Grants program uh, through our education courses uh, like this one and our new Maintain Right course on how uh, 
people can maintain and steward their own uh, historic buildings in New Orleans. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you also, Daniil, our behind the scenes tech Thanks. guru, um, for making sure that this went off without a hitch. And, and last but not least, thank you to everyone who was in the audience. I'm glad you could join us.